Kia ora, talofa, haere mai, and welcome. Boom shakalaka. This is the Variety Show, and we're here to highlight some things, talk about some things, discuss some things, think about some things, and get all thingy around Aotearoa sport. We are the Niche Cache, and we are here to broadcast Aotearoa sporting excellence and just do our best to celebrate Aotearoa Sporting Excellence and we have recorded the Patreon podcast prior to the Variety Show. So if you are a Patreon member, um, member of the Patreon whānau supporting the niche cash, make sure you check in the Patreon uh, feed on the Patreon page and the extra podcast will be there and the Patreon whānau is the best way to support the niche cash. So do that. Patreon.com forward slash our niche cash, E L niche cash, and you'll get an extra podcast every week. Uh, far greater propensity, word of the day, um, for us to go back and forth with you on the Patreon feed as well, as opposed to social media comments. So if you do love and support the niche cash and what we're doing, our mahi, jump on the Patreon Fano, patreon.com forward slash E L niche cash. And support us straight up the guts so we can keep on doing this mahi and you'll get some extra things as well every monday and friday afternoon evening or maybe tuesday and saturday morning depending on when you check your emails we deliver the email banger via substack the niche cache dot substack dot com every monday and friday evening we send out the email banger with all the niche cache content as well as extra yarns to our email banger team let's call them that the email banger team that's what it is and yeah always extra content whether it's the patreon there's extra content there whether it's the email banger there's some extra kiwi sports yarns there as well as all the regular niche case shit so you don't have to check uh, the social medias to get the latest content you can just check your email or how about this just get it straight from the horse's mouth just go straight to the niche case niche dash case dot com that is where we're always writing about Aotearoa sports. We are here for the variety show. And there's only one way to get the ball rolling, to push the ball down the mountain. It's a bit of a snowball. The theme of the podcast today, the variety show, is getting the snowball down the mountain. My snowball wildcard is going to be a super smash snowball. You've got a bit more of a pick and mix of kiwi sporting topics either way our snowball is now falling down the mountain got a bit of a momentum and we need some mindfulness just to slow us down and help us be present as we tumble down this mountain of the variety show indeed we do um which is where we refer to mr uh, alan watts who's oh look at that on the old youtube nice and Thing with the white book is that it doesn't show up on the green screen very well but um this is not an alan watts quote this is a quote from his uh what's this called the the way of zen um which comes from blah 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 the six precepts of telopa which i don't know what that is but i do like this quote uh which reads no thought no reflection no analysis no cultivation no intention let it settle itself Just let it be. In a manner of speaking, sure. Yeah, it's just, uh, well, the thing that comes to mind there is we can be, uh, you know, we're, we we analyze sports to some extent as well. And that doesn't, re that's not too beneficial in regular life. Like analyzing how your day went can have benefits, but dwelling on that in your mind or dwelling on how a situation may play out dwelling on how a situation has played out those type of things aren't really beneficial compared to just being just being present in the moment and letting that thing figure itself out as a separate entity well particular particularly things that you can't really control eh? like um things that are beyond your reach 
you might as well just kind of like um let those separate snowballs roll their way down the hill because you're not going to be able to stop them um and just worrying about it is not going to help and yeah in those situations um things like thought reflection and analysis cultivation intention um can be like self-defeating or i guess in a, in a um in a more um what's i don't know uh, mundane way or g generic way of putting it like a waste of time <laughs> you're just um, wasting energy on things that aren't that important um yeah the, the that's definitely um i assume that's i <laughs> probably have to read the whole chapter to get an idea of what he was actually doing with that with in terms of the context of that quote but like um i'd imagine that somewhere close to what it's about is just like that sort of like um uh yeah except the things you can't change and um and don't bloody get yourself all up in a bloody tizzy about it if you if you're in that situation can i offer something that is on my mind as far as mindfulness goes it is by all means the week of christmas <clears throat> and christmas yeah that's why i've got a... on the youtube i've got rhea percival throwing um i don't even know what they are they're like little quotes things um onto a teammate's head it's by a christmas tree is seasonal um seasonal uh what's that word for uh but i was gonna say vocations but that's not quite the right word um games <laughs> so grab a thesaurus listening to it and come up with something better than games but yeah there we go it is christmas and mm -hmm. god is a prominent figure at the time of christmas uh it's one of the one of the times of the year where god comes to the fore uh, whether you a uh, whether you're a strong believer in the christian version of god or not if you're not you still have christmas right so whether you like it or not god is here at this time of year he is extremely out there you know he's it's summertime no shirt it's the season of god you know it's just god's out there he's in the streets i was in the streets during the week the previous week and i saw you know how people ride in their cars and they got their arm out the window yep yep yep, yep. and well someone had in that site someone had fear god tattooed on their forearm right there i was next to them turned over and i was like fear god i was thinking and i've heard this said other other places i want to share it because it is the week of god of the christian god why the fuck would i fear god god loves Thank me you. god god already he, he already loves me there's no fear there god is the ultimate thing of peace and love and light so why would i be scared of someone or something that only loves me the only the only thing they have for me is love so why would i fear god and if i can take this further because it is the season of god and a lot of people are going to be talking to god they're going to be asking for forgiveness if god loves me automatically god's already forgiven me you know like I don't have to ask for forgiveness. I don't have to fear God. God is already there. He's already got it. He already knows all the shit that needs to be forgiven. And he or she, sorry, he or she, they, they already love me. It's all good. You don't need to fear God and you don't have to ask for forgiveness. So it is Christmas. We are on the week of Christmas. And I'm here. And all my divine spiritual expertise, that is the wrong word, all my divine spiritual knowing and understanding. There's no need to fear God. There's no need to ask for forgiveness. Just chill the fuck out. God already loves you. They already forgive you. Nothing further needs to be done. You just need to channel the god that you are and love yourself forgive yourself because yeah 
You can under first thing you got to understand that God loves you and God has already forgiven you. But if you know that, well, loving yourself, forgiving yourself becomes a little bit easier at the end of the day. So I just had to share that wild card. It is the season of God. You know, we're coming into Christmas, whether you like it or not, whether you're an atheist, whether you're a fucking miserable old bugger, whether you're a, uh, you know, Christmas morning at church type of joker, whatever you are, just chill the fuck out because God already loves you. You are already forgiven. Don't worry. Just be yourself. Yeah, I've I've thought about that plenty as well. On the same thing, um, like so many people use religion as like an oppressive um, thing to control other people, right? Like we know that this is how um, how organized religion has often acted in the communities, um, and one of the ways they do that is with like visions of a vengeful God, and that's bloody it's. It's ex for exactly why you what all of the stuff you just said like i've always thought how weird that is like how do people not see that as the blasphemous thing um of like the idea of some kind of like a god who's out there trying to punish people and um and it's like fuck you created everyone so what do you what do you bloody got to moan about um is it sort of like when you um i don't know when you just, I don't know, try bake a cake or something and it doesn't come out right and you just get annoyed and throw it away and maybe it's that maybe it's that kind of thing it's like well i made a mistake this is stupid um uh, but like yeah no, um full agreement of all that you were just saying also Abe will take it even further of the the point you made about the he or she i i also don't understand how god could have a gender like how how is how is um how is like a creator supposed to represent only half the population like that it seems really weird and um you know patriarchal and surely if anything god would be like both um male and female or some like sub gendered um not sub gendered the, the opposite of sub like above gendered version of um like beyond uh, beyond gender being if that makes sense um that's also really weird whenever it's always like very emphasis on like he and the father and things like this it's like well like it's, it seems it seems reductive to me as well for the same reasons. So I guess what you're saying is that dude with his arm sticking out the car probably needs to get that tattoo removed. Well, it was a female, but let's not oh, overcomplicate okay. it, right? Like, just don't fear God. God loves you. You're already forgiven. God already forgives you. So just chill the fuck out and have a happy old time. Bingo. We are starting our variety show. I've got a Super Smash party, so I'm going to dish out some Super Smash awards. But I'm going to throw it over to you here, Wildcard. Not sure what you've got planned for the first segment, but we are all here ready for you to express your creativity in a non-stiff manner, as we discussed on the Patreon podcast. Yes, I have. Uh, um, I've written another poem in keeping with the last few weeks, and it is a short poem, and it is a poem which I will tell you the title of it afterwards because it probably sums the works a little bit better that way and the poem goes as thus the road is paved with struggle and doubt you can't turn back and there's no way out the offside flag and the whistle won't help but it will get better from here on out that poem is called cc the wellington phoenix a bit more hopeful than i was expecting uh, yeah. a wellington phoenix poem i thought a bit bit of a there was a bit of a melancholy undertone, but there was a hopeful light at the end of the tunnel as well. So I like how those ideas were presented. There you go. Car you pie, know, car pie. Reinforcements are on the way for the men's team and the women's team are fresh to the scene. They're only going to get better with more games. You know, it's, it's, a, it's a long process. I'm going to dish out some Super Smash Awards where just probably finish the opening the first stanza of Super Smash Cricket. And I'm going to say my favorite Super Smash players, men and women. And it's uh, no surprise they're right behind me. So we got Cartney Clark, Northern Brave, opening batter. Um, fantastic individual performance and a good Northern win yesterday. Really impressive run out. And he took a catch where he was already sliding for a couple of meters before he actually caught the ball. Um, 
But generally speaking, Katane Clark is my favorite Super Smash player because he's a Tonka. Gives it a Tonka up the top of the order. So you always like, if you're watching Northern, there's a chance Katane Clark is going to be blazing boundaries. And that's what he does in the Super Smash. So you're, he's either going to get out or he's going to be blazing boundaries. That's always fun. And I believe Katane Clark is the best fielder in the men's Super Smash. He's always uh, around the boundary. He got his run out yesterday, hunting around in the in, the, in a circle. Great pickup, direct hit. And I think in Super Smash T20 cricket, if you have a if you have excellent fielders out on the boundary, it's an asset. And I think that is what Cartney Clark is. I mean, if he isn't already as the best fielder in the Super Smash, in my humble opinion. And he is a one of many young sluggers that I'll touch on and deepen the mangroves as well. So Kartane Clark is my favorite men's Super Smash player to start the season. On the woman's side, we have Eden Carson, young off spinner who is also a very good fielder. Uh, I saw her take a catch a couple of weeks ago, a week ago or so, caught and bowled off her off spin bowling. It was absolutely smashed to her at the bowler's end and she pouched it as if like cool as a cucumber and it was smashed back at her and she had no dramas. She was a good fielder, supreme young talent, off spin bowler. Um, and as far as her spin bowling goes, she's got the, uh, the look to her spin bowling that the best spinners have. I think other spin bowlers like Fran Jonas and, uh, even someone like Sarah Asmussen or Sophie Oldershaw, they have this type of look to their spin bowling. We saw it with East Shoddy against Auckland yesterday as well, spinning the ball both ways, variation, flight. And it's something we saw with uh, the youngster Adi Ashok for Auckland as well, flight, scene position. Eden Carson is cut from that same cloth. She will play for the White Ferns at some stage. She... Looks like a fun player out on the field. Always having a laugh. Good fielder. Excellent spin bowler. So she is my favorite uh, woman Super Smash player. And she is also in an undefeated Otago Sparks team after four games. So Cartonet Clark on the men's side. Eden Carson on the women's side. My two favorite Super Smash players to start the season. Let's get a bit of a statistic here, Wildcard. You've had a lot of Stephen Adams statistics over recent weeks as well so i'm curious what you're going to dish up there is it you know is it the jump balls is it the uh, on off percentage is it a three point percentage you know 50 from 50 from three point range that's what stephen adam does say eh? uh 0.0 percent from three point range no this is a um this is a a Stephen Adams stat that I think actually a run of Stephen Adams stats that I think Stephen Adams would appreciate more than most because they're actually not that they're only 20% to do with him. And that's even just when he's on the court. Um, so I'm talking about Grizzlies in general here and they've had this run where they've just all of a sudden gone on this like burst of, of wins. Um, and it's come immediately coinciding with Jamarant getting injured. Their best player has been out and they've suddenly gotten real good. Um, they did lose to the Blazers most recently, uh, but they're likely to pump the Thunder pretty soon after this um, podcast is recorded. Last time they played the Thunder, they beat them by an NBA record, 73 points. So uh, pro probably safe bet to say they'll do that one again. Um, so prior to that game, they've been 11-2 and two without Ja Morant, surging up the Western Conference standings. Adams is playing his best stuff for maybe like two years, um, getting contributions from all over the place. Ja Morant is back to questionable for that Thunder game, um, so a return is imminent. Um, but here are some stats from the first 10 of those games, because um, I've already done the research for the last Kiwi Steve write-up, so I'll just uh, regurgitate some of them again. Um, emphasize is a better word. So... 
across those first 10 games without Ja Morant, they had the most rebounds in the league by almost three boards per game. They had the most steals per game by almost three, um, most blocks per game, sick best offensive rating with the single best defensive rating, including, including being the only team under triple figures. Um, and this is a team that before Morant got injured was one of the worst defensive ratings. And then in the stretch without him, they suddenly become the best. Um, best net rating, best offensive rebounding percentage, the most points of turnovers, second most points of second chance points, uh, most first fast break points as well. Um, all three of those are things that come very strongly from defense. Um, second in terms of points in the paint, which uh, yeah, almost made that a quadrilogy. They uh, given up the fewest opposition second chance points and the second fewest opposition points in the paint. Um, and yeah, they've. <laughs> Across that thing, they've been winning by 20, they're winning margins across that streak. 27 points, 7 points, 73 points, 7 points, 15 points, and they lost by 8 points. 1 by 13 points, 1 by 7, 1 by 35 points, then 10 points. Uh, overall differential of plus 186 from 10 games. Um, since then, there's been a 19 point win and a comeback over the Sacramento Kings, and then a five point loss to the Portland uh, Trailblazers. So we'll soon see how that defense adjusts when Morant goes back in because he's, you know, he's not a fantastic defender. He's an outrageously good attacking um, offensive player. But um, I, I tend to think that that transition is a little bit overblown. The idea that they'll suddenly lose all this great, um, you know, all this all this fresh goodness on defense um, when he returns. I think um, more th more than anything, I reckon just bringing your best player back in is probably going to make the team better. And if they're doing this without him, if they can keep some of these improvements with him, they're going to be a pretty uh, they're going to be a pretty tasty team come playoff time by the looks of it. My Statistical note here centers around Northern Brave Seema Anurag Verma, who has six wickets at an average of 10.16, RP of 6.2, and a strike rate of 9.8, which is very impressive, although it's not the best. We've got like Freddie Walker's got a super smash strike rate of 7.6. We've got Scott Kugeline. Um, another northern bowler, he's got a strike rate of 9.2. So there's a lot of low strike rates in the Super Smash, understandable, given a small sample size. But I'm interested in Anurag Verma because he is very good with the ball for Northern to start this season. And I was thinking Anurag Verma has been around for a while. He, was, he had a period where he was playing for Wellington um, hasn't been like a consistent member of like Plunkett Shield cricket has focused a bit more on white ball cricket. And I checked out his uh, New Zealand cricket archive and he's played seven years of Super Smash cricket since 2014. In six out of those seven years, he has an average below, uh, an average of 27 or below with a strike rate of 20 or below. Or well, strike rates all below 20 in six out of those seven years. So his worst year was 2016-17, average of 46, strike rate of 28. That's the one year where he didn't have a strike rate below 27, or average below 27, a strike rate below 20. Um, other than that, he is taking Super Smash wickets at an average below 27 and a strike rate below 20. So Anurag Verma has basically been a very good T20 Super Smash Bowler for six of the last seven years. And when you think about players who, I don't know, Wildcard, I was just thinking like you compare Anurag Verma to Jacob Duffy. Jacob Duffy got his T20 debut for the Black Caps this time last year. And Jacob Duffy in the Super Smash has not been very good since then. Whereas if you compare him to Verma, Verma is consistently excellent, but doesn't really get that attention. So just want to pull up the uh, Duffy numbers here because I did have them before. Let's go. Yeah, just Anurag Verma doesn't get the love he deserves, but I don't think anyone knows that he has been very good for a while. And Jacob Duffy last summer, four wickets at an average of 85, strike rate of 55. This summer in the Super Smash, two wickets and an average of 60 and a strike rate of 42. 
So Jacob Duffy made his T20 debut and hasn't been very good. Last two super smashes where you've got someone like Anurag Verma, who has been low-key, consistently good throughout his super smash cricket career, which I just found a bit interesting there. Let's go deep into the Mangroves wildcard. Um, I believe you're you're talking about the big uh, Jake Paul boxing fight there. Um, right initials, wrong boxer, <laughs> different JP. Um, yeah, just a, just like you know, a quick reaction on the on the Joseph Parker fight. Um, super impressive performance, even without the KO. He came in at his heaviest weight and seemed to give him a bit of a boost in strength without fatiguing him too much. It was definitely some fatigue from carrying the extra kgs, um, extra four kgs it was, um, but only a little, not too much. He pretty much bossed the fight from round one. He kept active, throwing combinations, not letting Chisora settle, constantly tagging away at him. Couple knockdowns in there. Did fade through the middle rounds. Chisora got a bit of a second win. The crowd got on the um, feet in support of him, and he sort of fed off of that. But um, Parker soon reasserted himself for one of, I reckon, one of his better heavyweight wins, to be honest. Um, Chisora can't complain about the cards this time either, because despite the unanimous win, they were way skewed in DC's favor. Um Parker had three knockdowns, and one of the judges had it scored only as a two-point victory for him, which is absolute madness. But in the end, right man won. Um, so the question now is, what does he do next? Because I wrote a bit in my preview about how there really isn't scope for a title fight for potentially up to two years for him, um, just with bouts all wrapped up and other you know, de mandatory defenses and guys like uh, you know, Anthony Joshua doesn't like to fight more than twice a year anyway. And um although he doesn't have any bouts at the moment um that might not be the worst thing for joseph parker though because andy lee said his new trainer said that there's still a 50 percent improvement to come from parker based on what he saw in this fight and this fight was pretty impressive so um he might also just want a few more fights under his belt at this new weight if that's something he plans on maintaining um so you know, there's it's a couple of years just to just to really get in the swing of things. Might not be the worst thing in the world, um, and it doesn't get any more deep in the macros than listening to what Eddie Hearn has to say. So um, they asked him after the fight, "What is next for Parker?" And he suggests, "Well, this I'll just read out his full quote." Um, he said, "I like the Herkovich fight. That's a really good fight with the winner getting a chance to fight the winner of AJ and Usyk. There's Wilder, a Andy Ruiz rematch, Ortiz. There's loads of fights for Joseph Parker, and he has put himself right back in the mix." Um, Philippe Hergovic would be in IBF Eliminator, which is why he's saying there's a chance at U6 slash AJ. But I think, um, you know, obviously a unification bout against Tyson Fury would trump that. So I, I'm not sure that's necessarily the, the quick path to a title challenge that it sounds like. Um, Frank Sanchez is another name I've seen mentioned. Um, personally, I would dig the Andy Ruiz rematch. I think that would be quite an interesting one to see where those two guys are at now at this stage in their careers. Um, but the important thing is that Joseph Parker, after an impressive fight against Derek Chisora, he seems to have options, and that's what you want. You want options. That's the key. I have options for my Deep in the Mangroves because I'm going to un unleash a list of Super Smash notes that I am thinking about, and I've got plenty of options on where to start. I'm going to start on the Young Sluggers, though, which includes Cartane Clark for Northern. Very attacking opening batsman, free flowing shots around the park. We know Finn Allen is a great young slugger, probably Aotearoa's best slugger, I'd say. Although, you know, big old Munro and the big, big, uh, big, 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 big bash Lee, he's doing all right as well. So the large bash, the large bash. Um, yeah, but Finn Allen, one of the best sluggers, we know that. So he's an obvious one. Shout out Cartane Clark. Josh Clarkson has been on the scene for a while, and he has always been a notable young slugger. He's currently operating with a strike rate of 215 in the Super Smash. So keep an eye on Josh Clarkson. Meanwhile, Finnellan's strike rate at the moment is 192. So that shows you all you need to know about Josh Clarkson and Finn Allen. The low-key one is a young chap by the name of Lou Johnson. Every time I say Lou Johnson, I think of uh, Drake saying, like, Lou Williams. And then I'm thinking, like, imagine if there was a dude who resembled Lou Williams, but instead of L-O-U, his, his name was L-L-E-W. 
and he was like just right. some the welsh spelling the welsh spelling but he was like a baller nba player six man of the year and you know general lover of life so that would be a pretty funny but yeah respect to lou johnson this is about lou johnson and i'm really enjoying what i'm seeing with lou johnson for otago great hand action and he is a certified slugger as well in the middle order for otago although he hasn't quite fired just yet that is to say he's got a strike rate of 175 after two games so he has been pretty damn impressive so i like lou johnson and those are my four sluggers as of right now Finn Allen, Cartonet Clark, Josh Clarkson, and Lou Johnson. Shout out Bailey Wiggins. He's a really aggressive young batsman as well with CD. So I'll chuck him in there as well. And Lou, uh, Leo Carter has always been on my radar as a certified six hitter. So there's some young sluggers to keep an eye on. We also have official Matt Fisher buzz. Northern Brave Seema, who... There's no speed guns in the uh, Super Smash, so we don't know what pace he's bowling, but commentary and eye test seems to be rolling, bowling really fast, and he is having a pretty damn impressive start to the Super Smash. So the big thing in the Super Smash, I'd say bowling-wise, is the Matt Fisher buzz. Arguably one of the fastest bowlers in New Zealand, along with Ben Sears. If you're seeing Wellington or Northern play Super Smash games, Got to tune in to Matt Fisher. Got to tune in to Ben Sears. Cartony Clark, best fielder in the uh, Super Smash. ND, Northern Districts, Northern Brave, I'd say the best fielding team in the Super Smash so far. Northern Woman, not the best fielding team. So it's an interesting dynamic there. One of the teams is really good at fielding, and I think Northern Brave Woman, their fielding has let them down a wee bit. However, Shout out to Nancy Patel. She is a very talented young cricketer for Northern Brave as well. And I'm very excited to see how she develops. Um, another one on the women's side. We've got Lee Kasparik, Amelia Kerr, and Frances Mackay, top five for wickets and top five for runs. So Lee Kasparik and Amelia Kerr are doing that for Wellington. So they are basically doing everything for Wellington. They got the most wickets and the most runs. And then Frances Mackay, she is top five as well. Men's bowling chart, it's all seamers. Women's bowling chart, top of the charts, mainly spin bowlers. So that's something that's happening as well. Then we've got the White Ferns context for the women's cricket, where I'm fascinated to see how players like Holly Huddleston perform. She could add a lot to the White Ferns, but she recently fell out of the mix for the White Ferns. Um, and then you've got players like Anna Pearson and Katie Perkins who could really help at a home World Cup, but unfortunately they have already retired. This leads us to White Ferns players in the Super Smash not really performing so well. Um, the CD trio is the most concerning right now. Hannah Rowe, Rosemary Mayer, and Claudia Green. CD Hines are 0 and 4, and they have all played. They all, uh, Rosemary Mayer has been out injured, but Rowe and Green toured England with the White Ferns and haven't really kicked on. Um, so that's another interesting dynamic with the Women's Super Smash is what the White Ferns are doing. Top tier White Ferns, they're all dominating, but then there's this group of White Ferns who have been selected for camps and squads who are not quite performing. Meanwhile, a bunch of other players are stepping up. Um, just a couple of names here. I mentioned Nancy Patel before. Um, Otago Sparks have Carson. They've got Molly Lowe. They've got Emma Black. A bunch of players for Otago to keep an eye on. And Polly Inglis for Otago is scoring runs. Kate Ibrahim is fantastic and should be in the mix as well. And then someone like Lauren Down is probably really interesting. She has been in the White... She's one of the players who has been in the White Ferns consistently recently and hasn't quite kicked on. And I think she can kick on in the Super Smash. So just a couple of notes there. I will write about... Uh, do top five Super Smash notes for men and women tomorrow. So keep an eye on that at the niche dash cashcom Question time here, Wildcard. I'm just going to do an easy one. Just do an easy one to start here, warm you up. Who's a better batsman? Tim Southey or Stuart Broad? 
And this is, I think this is interesting because they both started their careers pretty, uh, as having a lot of potential with their batting. And I'm curious right now who you think is a better batsman, Tim Southey or Stuart Broad? Yeah, they're both guys who people were talking up being future all-rounders. And then it sort of seems like very few players who are not all-rounders when they get selected become all-rounders later on. Like Daniel Vittori is a rare case in that example. Um, it used to be Stuart Broad. And then like the famous incident of him getting hit on the head um, by, was it like Mitchell Johnson or something? I can't remember. Um, and then he got scared of the short ball and then he became just a bit of a skittish batsman. Um, still has his moments. Tim Sally has his moments as well. I, I want to say Tim Sally for that reason, for like the narrative switch, but I think it's probably about even to be honest. Um, but Tim Sally is more like more, maybe more versatile just because he can hit a few sixes and score a few quick runs. They, they, they're both going to last about as long as each other. Um, but Saudi will probably have a better strike rate and therefore more runs. So you can probably make a case for Tim Saudi in that, in that way. I think you can definitely say it is Tim Saudi. And it's far beyond a case. Tim Saudi actually tries to bat, whereas it's clear Stuart Broad, he's yeah. kicking back. He's chilling. Yeah. And, and, and respect. Counts. Respect to Stuart Broad, like why we don't necessarily, who gives a fuck? Just have a bowl. Your question. My question is how much attention do you put on the commentary when you're watching specifically to when you're watching sports that you write about? Like I asked this cause I've been watching some super smash and I know you have been too. Um, and it reminded me a little bit of some of the stuff watching, um, uh, South Central series football and like there were obvious there were games where I would just watch on mute because I'm like I'm not going to learn anything here and therefore I don't really need to I don't need to hear anything um there were certainly like times at the start like I want to hear the team list in case I they, they mentioned someone as so and so is like information that I don't otherwise have um so and so is unavailable because they got injured at training this week like I wouldn't know that difference between them being out injured or them being dropped I'd have to write around that so things like that but then once the game started i genuinely generally felt like um there was just nothing left to learn and i would watch some of those games some a couple of the commentators are quite like so i would listen to them anyway um just because they're interesting not because i felt necessarily that i would learn anything but i, I made me wonder how you address that kind of um that just that uh that balance when it comes to watching super smash games where you are writing about them and i've heard some weird like not necessarily the most informed takes on players from super smash stuff where it's like maybe look at the plunkett shield numbers before you commentate don't just like you know um like ignoring things like that and uh, overseas um performances and etc cetera, etc cetera. um but you're the one who writes uh super smash stuff so i wonder how that is affected for you i think you have very high expectations of of coverage and commentary like if, you, if you're expecting anything from south central series coverage that's that's you're going to be disappointed so maybe a bit of mindfulness here like just don't just ease up on your expectations of of broadcasting and commentary especially the more grassroots we go. And I think, understandably so, we watch so much international sports that there is like a certain standard that is set of information, of insights, of entertainment, that when you do come back to Aotearoa sports, it can be a bit of a, like, what the fuck's going on here? Because you might tune into a Super Smash game on TV1 or on Duke, and you might miss a delivery for no reason you know those type of things do happen but that's the grassroots shit that's the shit we like that's the shit that makes it wholesome and makes it fun um well you have to be realistic and i would realistically say that i know more than the commentators so i'm not looking for them to provide me with any insights so you're you're asking me about like i have a very unique perspective because i right now i'm deep in the weeds of super smash in the same way that at another time i'm deep in the weeds deep in the mangroves with rugby league matters 
and I'm pretty conf. I'm, I'd back my like if I'm a batsman and I've got my Super Smash men's and women's knowledge in like within me, I'm going out there to bat. And I'm playing reverse sweeps, I'm playing laps, I'm hitting sixes down the ground, lofted drives, rotating the strike, because I back my abilities. No one respectfully, and it's just like don't want to be, you know, arrogant here. I don't think many people in Aotearoa can fuck with my super smash domestic cricket knowledge. So that is my perspective. And I'm coming in to a you know, Super Smash game, and I don't expect my knowledge from the commentators, right? Like, even if you're talking about the Ashes and you're a keen cricket fan, you can see what's happening, so you don't necessarily tune into the commentary of the Ashes to find out what's happening. I kind of listen to the Ashes commentary just, like, in the same way I listen to the Super Smash commentary. It's just there is a partner to the entertainment and like i've chuckled many times during the ashes commentary because like old warney can say anything at any fucking time and it's gonna it might like if it's random if it's funny if it's weird it's gonna be part of the entertainment you know there's well, what's the other jerry's name skull kerry o'keefe kerry o'keefe like you can have a chuckle at him any moment and i say that because when you watch super smash I think you get the basics and then you get the entertainment and it's, it's all delivered in a very Kiwi way, which is fine. Like um, regardless of what you think about Mark Richardson, the media personality, when he's watching a game of cricket, he's funny. Like it doesn't matter. He's just there to make it like a comfortable environment. And actually without going too deep into this, cause we've got to keep it fucking moving. Like who gives a shit how I think about commentators, but apart from yourself, um, they were talking about this yesterday on the coverage. Richardson and, and Scotty Sumo and Stevenson were talking about the makeup of a T20 game, uh, balance between bat and ball, and how hearty cricket fans might view it as opposed to casual fans. So hearty cricket fans might enjoy the contest between bat and ball in a T20 game, where casual cricket fans, they might just want to see sixes. And I think credit to the Super Smash coverage they have to encompass everyone. And when you encompass everyone as they do, you don't want to get too deep into the minutia of this player has done this, this, and this, and the Plunkett Shield and the Ford Trophy, because you're also just catering to, catering to people who want to see an entertaining product on a hot summer's afternoon. So I actually think that they do a good job of that. Um, and for me personally, I am confident and I put a lot of work into my own insights and I also make a habit of enjoying the product. Like it's, I, I want to be in a position where I'm enjoying the game of cricket, I'm enjoying the coverage, I'm having a chuckle and at the same time I am processing information for my own insights to, to bring out at a later time. One more question. You mentioned Joseph Parker before. We also had David Naika on the same card. And I'm curious, who looked better in victory? Joseph Parker or David Naika? Yeah. Um, I mean, they, they, they both won um, fairly comprehensively. I think, um, I think you do have to go with Joseph Parker there. And it's not necessarily... Um, like just because he showed a lot of different stuff, like he showed an evolution in what he's um, been working on. He showed progress with the new trainer, um, and he showed a like a much more con he earned a much more convincing victory than he got over Chizora in the first fight against him. So, um, with that in mind, compare that to David Nika, who's like. Um, yeah, it one it was a one and done in terms of the rounds. Like he went out there. Um, just sort of went through the went through his stuff for, for three minutes and um, comfortably won the round. And then the other dude never came back because he had a, I think a sore elbow, something along those lines. A like inju injury um, withdrawal game over. Um, Nika with the victory. 
but it wasn't anything different from him. It was just more of the same. We knew he had a like a fight that would be a little bit of a walkover. It was sort of there for him to be a showcase rather than him to like um, you know risk anything. He was he was going to win regardless. It was the kind of fight they set up for him, and it was more just an introduction to like the i'd say the british heavyweight scene in particular well cruiserweight in his case but um british boxing scene in particular um but like um just also an experience for him building him up as a new pro so uh, there's nothing we learned or saw like from for them sure like there was a lot of great praise for um for nika afterwards from the from the um you know the the british uh wider seen the um the pundits that were at the event and all that but that's because they'd never seen him fight before like this was an introduction as i say uh, for us not an introduction more of the same what we expect from david nika um went out there did that whereas joseph parker actually like evolved his style and showed us new things and that was so yeah i think parker probably gets a comfortable uh, nudge on on that question i'd say points victory for joe parker there another one musical jam I just want to set out the um, the music coverage I'm going to do over the next week to round out 2021. I'm going to do a collection of Aotearoa hip hop um, from the second half of 2021. I did one for the first half, so now it's just time to do the second half. There will be a Sounds of Aotearoa as well, which is only Aotearoa music um, from the past month or so as well. So we've got a lot of uh there'll be a hub for aotearoa music and there'll be a hub for aotearoa hip-hop so stay tuned for those um at the niche-case.com will be wildcard any uh musical jam that you wish to share um the new neil young and crazy horse album out which is interesting is as interesting as they get with a dude that deep into his career so um a couple uh there's there's one song called i think going back something like that which is an absolute ripper like that's just neil young and crazy horse just torching it up um the rest of this album's a bit hit or miss so it's that's sort of how it goes um nobody else really releasing music at this time of the year so i think the other thing to do would just be to continue on what you're saying and, and point out that i will have my top 10 albums of the year list out uh, in a day or two i'm i'm sort of chipping away at that i've i'm closing in on finishing um now i've almost got my 10 sorted probably about seven or eight of those albums locked in and then they've got to cut write a couple blurbs and figure out the last two so uh that one's um that one's still in the oven but it's almost done and i'll i'll have that in a day or two as well cowabunga just go. remember god loves you you're already forgiven raise your mana Raise your mana because God already loves you and you're already forgiven. So that just makes it a whole lot easier to raise your own mana in Kia Kaha. There you go. That is your Turanga Waiwai for God's season. And God's season is so impactful. It's so uh, enjoyable. And it's so just beautiful that we're going to take next week off. So there won't be any podcasts next week, but we will do podcasts in the first week of 2022, hopefully. So we're going to take some time for God's season. We're going to take some time to connect with the love of God and the forgiveness of God. And we're probably going to, you know, drink a couple of beers, probably going to smoke some weed, probably going to play a bit of golf, probably going to play, you know, get in the surf, probably going to get on the, on the beach and, get the toes on the grass get the toes on the sand we're going to probably going to burn a few souls on the uh on the beach as well break a couple of jandals and anything else because god loves us and we're already forgiven so it's all god all good and it's all god god season cheers